Okay, go ahead. Very good. Thanks, Carla. Um, I think Jim. You're Walmart welcome. Is, uh, oh, look what you're doing. This, like that. This, this evening, um, I will be handling the conference call uh, for Zach Smith. Zach is <clears throat> out um, working with one of our district managers in Canada, and uh, they they are participating in a meeting. And his coverage is a little weak in the area that they're actually in. So uh, I'm going to just kind of pinch it for him this evening. And normally what we do is uh, I, I cover current events in agriculture. Uh, and then uh, we head towards the uh, calendar, basically. People that uh, are featured uh, on the calendar are usually the people that we're talking to um, at the so we have quite a few high points that we need to cover because next month is going to be totally different. The conference call, as most of you recognize it, will be totally different. And uh, we'd like to go over that a little bit uh, so that uh, uh, salesmen and uh, customers know because uh, we're basically handling our annual sales meeting much differently this year with the COVID situation that's going on, uh, you know, out in the field. So far as current events are concerned, I think really the biggest thing that uh, people want to uh, know about is uh, the price of corn and beans and wheat uh, that's made a significant run here uh, in the last several days, although it had been building prior to that. Uh, as we got to the end of October, there were a couple reports um, on stored grain that really shed a little light on uh, what's actually out there. And see, this has been brewing for quite some time now. If you go back to 2019 and the wet weather that uh, encompassed a lot of the Corn Belt and even Canada, uh, the quality issue on corn particularly has always been in question. And the U.S. government in their reporting had pretty well shut their eyes to uh, the quality situation. Several of our uh, customers, uh, larger uh, livestock feeding customers, were quite concerned about this issue and were discussing this with us. Oh, that'd be a year ago, actually, in the summer, when a lot of guys had prevent plant. Uh, these guys knew that there was going to be some issues uh, with the quality because of the lack of sunlight. And the government uh, actually ignored it completely until October of 2020, when they actually came out and said that, you know, what's still left uh, in in storage has dropped quite significantly. And see, this goes along with the quality issue as far as utilization on livestock. Uh, same thing uh, in the ethanol market the amount of alcohol availability because alcohol is uh, basically a sugar and that's coming from photosynthetic activity. And if you just don't have the sunlight, uh, the total volume of energy it's going to be there is going to be significantly less. And see, after they had the Dorico that occurred in Iowa uh, with the significant damage that they experienced, uh, then they started to recognize uh, this, this uh, volume issue and see here in the uh, last report which occurred on Tuesday of this week uh, they they really revised those numbers significantly now <clears throat> they did revise the actual yield numbers both corn and beans corn came down uh, a little over three bushel uh, soybeans a little over a bushel and see right away this started to put pressure on the market uh, because at the same time, they raised the export numbers. And so we had a significant run after the report came out. Now, there's been a little bit of uh, backwater on that now, uh, particularly with corn, but uh, it's still ahead of where it was at the beginning on Tuesday. And see, again, this is uh, a factor with the volume that is still in storage, the volume that's coming in, the volume that's being exported uh, has exacerbated all of that. And then the weather has played into that. <clears throat> We've had customers and reps in Iowa that have been telling us for quite some time now that 
there is more significant yield damage out there uh, that, than the government is actually recognizing. And finally, they did, they did come around and recognize that with this last report. So again, uh, all these factors together uh, really gave us a significant run. And they're, they're, some of the advisors are saying that uh, they believe farmers have to be a little careful with this because uh, there is a lot of speculation that's gone into this price too. Uh, the number of longs or the people that over own uh, these contracts is very, very significant. It's one of the largest long contracts held by speculators since uh, 2013. And most of you guys realize that was after the drought in Illinois and when we saw some markets that were $7 corn and 15 buck beans. And they started to chatter a little bit about that, but the, uh, the market kind of retracted a little bit. <clears throat> so again, I, I think farmers have to really, you know, look this over closely. And uh, if these speculators run to the door, uh, this thing could deflate very quickly and see the, the influx or the increase in COVID cases. Uh, we're seeing quite an influx or an increase in that caseload here in the state of Ohio. Um, and it's happening in other states also. Uh, the, the biggest fear of discussing it with my daughter this evening is that a lot of these hospitals are going to be short staffed. Uh, some of the staff is getting sick. Uh, plus just the number of people that are coming uh, to the hospital looking for help uh, has gone up quite significantly. So they're quite concerned about that. Um, this, this plays into what we've done as a company um, with our annual meeting. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, every year in December, uh, we'd like to bring our representatives uh, to Ohio from around the country that uh, we work with and we pass on some of the research information that we've been working with uh, and the guys just get the chance to interact with each other and find out what's happening in those areas of the country. Uh, the, we made a decision that, that uh, growers um, early on uh, last summer uh, with the, uh, the influx of cases that we had <clears throat> to scuttle that, uh, that particular meeting. And again, it had nothing to do with our concern with our people. It was more trying to live with the regulators um, at the local level. Uh, we've had some farm shows that have been canceled strictly by the health departments in the areas where those farm shows were to be held. And if you've noticed, there have been some major shows that have been canceled already. Uh, some of you guys say, well, it's California, you got to understand that. And, and that may be true, uh, but we've seen some of these other shows that have been canceled already and they've gone to a virtual one that's done on the uh, computer. And so that is kind of the decision that we made was to have a virtual annual meeting this year. Um, and <clears throat> part of that was that we didn't want to offend, uh, you know, the local people in the area of Ohio. Uh, the governor has been on TV uh, quite frequently here recently with the higher caseload that has occurred and is threatening the uh, restaurants. Uh, threatening places that hold weddings and that type of thing, uh, that they basically will shut them down. And so we just felt uh, that we didn't want to risk that. Uh, okay, if they shut us down, that's, you know, if guys have traveled, that's a problem. But we're more concerned with manufacturing. Uh, the way we conducted our business last year, uh, the local officials uh, were quite pleased with our protocols uh, and things that we were doing. And again, um, you have to realize in the spring of the year, you know, we're, we're it's it's very busy with truck traffic at, at our plant. And see, they we wanted to make sure that they were happy so that they didn't come in and stop our manufacturing, stop our trucking, because our number one goal is we've got to get product to our customers. And so we just felt uh, the risk of having a public meeting 
in the environment that we have right now was uh, was far too risky uh, to create any problems with the local officials, whether it be health department, uh, the mayor, uh, or of anybody of political consequence. Because again, uh, things went very well for us last spring, and we want to make sure the same thing happens this year. Uh, we we feel that. Uh, <clears throat> the, the success of the product has been very good this year, and uh, there are people that are looking forward to working with us again next year. We want to make sure we're able to supply them. So again, that is uh, some of the reason that we want to talk to you about uh, what we're doing with this uh, virtual uh, annual meeting that we're having this year. So as far as the current events are concerned, um, the, uh, the run-up in prices, uh, you know, again, when you look at soybeans, it's something we haven't seen for probably since 13 or 14. And so, again, it's uh, kind of on a tenuous block there, teetering back and forth. So I believe guys have to look this over uh, quite significantly. And if this influx of the COVID uh, creates some of these shutdowns, uh, we're going to see demand change pretty significantly. Now, uh, in my position where we're harvesting crops, I mean, we're on a main thoroughfare that intersects with the Ohio Turnpike, you know, and the experts are saying that the usage of fuel is not, not back to pre-COVID. And I'll tell you right now, trying to get out of the field on the U.S. Route 6, I don't believe a word they say because it appears to me that uh, there's a significant amount of traffic, particularly truck traffic on the Ohio Turnpike. So again, I think the demand or the usage is, is there, even though the so-called knowledgeable people are saying it isn't. So again, this is part of the, the rationale of, uh, you know, this marketing thing. So the other, the other factor, this dryness here in the States, they're also saying that uh, Brazil, uh, you know, the initial run on beans was because the early planting of Brazilian beans was slowed way down because of the dry weather. And see, then they were supposed to have gotten some rain, which got the ball rolling down there. But the volume of rain that they were getting was not as high as they thought. Now, <clears throat> they're just saying with this last uh, you know, back down on price that uh, they're talking more uh, rain in Brazil. But again, that revision always comes uh, after that happens. So again, I think the dry weather, both Brazil and Argentina, uh, is going to affect both corn and beans. And see, the, the China usage is has been another factor. They've just been purchasing soybeans. That slowed down a little bit, but it's been quite significant for some time now and continues to head in that direction. So uh, as long as they keep buying corn and beans at the pace they're buying it now, I think you're going to see uh, a fair amount of, uh, uh, of export that's going to occur. So uh, hopefully that, uh, that will continue and that'll keep the legs under this market at this point. So to get back to the, uh, annual meeting, the uh, 10th of December is when our next conference call is supposed to be. And again, uh, the conference call has been on the same number. Uh, you have the same access code or PIN that you've been using. Now, that will change for December. Uh, we're going to have the annual meeting virtually, <clears throat> and we're using a zoom platform to do that so on the 10th uh, that evening which again is a thursday um, we're going to have um, a, a presentation that's going to include uh, various members um, out of Milan. Uh we're going to be focusing on a couple things uh, we're doing like a, a growers 101 where customers, if they have particular questions, or even our sales force, they have particular questions, so we'd invite them to participate in that. Also, that evening, we, ha we have arrived at a fertilizer cost analysis sheet 
that will be in the hands of our sales force. Uh, we did a little bit of work with this last summer. Uh, since that time, it's been decorated a little bit and changed so that you guys that have worked with it, we think we have simplified it to a certain degree. Uh, <clears throat> that will be coming out um, to the sales force. Uh, might not necessarily be in the December letter, but it'll come with another package that'll be going out here uh, before the annual meeting. And that fertilizer cost analysis, the thing that's a little bit different about it, you have all the um, fertilizer distributors, the co-ops uh, that uh, basically look strictly at cost. And <clears throat> we, we understand that and uh, we'll be looking at those costs uh, in comparison to growers. But then we're gonna be talking about availabilities also. Uh, we have some research work that was done back in the uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s uh, during the Clinton administration where <clears throat> they examined the different types of fertilization practices and what their availabilities came to. But see, this was uh, looked at significantly because of the Gulf of Mexico meetings that were held during the Clinton administration uh, and they basically know that there is a certain amount of loss of fertilizer. And so what they did was try to quantify this, and we've used that uh, in our analysis to try to show farmers that have always complained that growers just isn't putting on enough fertility elements to get the job done. Well, in reality, the availability of our elements is so significantly better than these other elements that you're working with that we're very, very competitive in what's going into the plant. <clears throat> and the, the bottom line to that is, is that excess is leaving the land. And see, this is where uh, we've got the problems in the various water systems. And see, that's something that we think farmers have to be uh, concerning themselves with. So that is part of that uh, analysis that uh, our sales force will be able to present that to customers or potential customers. Um, then on the uh, 17th, which will be the following Thursday uh, at noon Eastern time, we will present another seminar at that point, uh, which will be giving you uh, research work that the company is doing. And the thing with this virtual platform is that if you're able to <clears throat> get onto a computer and and work through the Zoom app, you know, you, you'll visually be able to see some of the pictures that are being created uh, through this research work. And the same thing is true on the Thursday night before, you know, as far as showing you the analysis, uh, how the sheets work, uh, that you should be able to look at virtually also. Now, some people are uh, struggle with that, uh, and we understand that. So it's basically been put together that you can just use your phone or your, just your flip phone if that's all you've got. Uh, but you won't be able to see anything, but you'll be able to hear the discussions that we actually have. So again, it's, it's been rather encompassing, but uh, if, if you can find someone that, can get on the Zoom app for you, uh, either on an iPad or, or on your laptop or, or on a regular computer. Um, <clears throat> that We think that uh, the presentation on uh, the 17th in the afternoon, uh, or at 12 noon, will be one that uh, the pictures of what we think will be very beneficial to you. We're actually looking at different fertilizer materials and how they react. Uh, everybody says, oh, it's the same as growers, only cheaper. Well, when we do some of these testing methodologies, we don't find that to be true at all, uh, that their, their product is corrosive, uh, their product doesn't uh, react with the plant the same way. We've got some weights showing that the absorption is significantly different between them. And see, again, this, this all goes back to, uh, you know, purity, balance, trying to work with the biological system, uh, you know, in the soil. And uh, we try to demonstrate these things so that we can show uh, potential farmers and those of you that work with growers 
why it works the way it does. So again, we have sent out um, invitations uh, for for these particular meetings, um, and the uh, sales force has cards. Uh, if you are a customer and you're interested in participating in this, we would we would like to have you register. Uh, but if you if you don't figure it out or you don't know how to register or you don't want to make the commitment, that's not a problem. It's it's still open to anyone. Our problem is that we have to set up a standard volume. In other words, how many Zoom people or how many people are going to be on Zoom that evening. Uh, we're, we're going to set it, we think, high enough, but again, we we don't know that if our Salesforce puts out more invitations, uh, we could exceed it. So that's why we're asking for the registration. But please don't let that be um, a impediment. If you don't register, uh, you'll still be able to get on to it, no problem, because we feel we've we've made our our uh, platform big enough that we should be able to take uh, everybody that's interested in it. And <clears throat> The number that you've been using for this conference call, it's not going to work. Uh, you have to get the uh, numbers that uh, are with those invitations. And that you get from your sales rep. Now, if you have a problem getting a hold of your rep, uh, just call Myland and uh, we'll gladly furnish you with that information so that uh, you're able to get on to the uh, presentation. And uh, another part of the um, uh, presentation on the 17th. Uh, this summer with this COVID crisis, um, uh, the administration was deciding that uh, they wanted to kind of uh, play ball with people around the country or the so-called uh, uh, important people, uh, the health departments and that. So I was basically restricted to Milan uh, Zach Smith was doing the traveling, and that's the way it's going to be this winter also. Uh, Zach will be traveling, uh, working with guys. Uh, we're going to let everybody in the different areas decide, you know, if they if they want to do a meeting, if they want to have small groups. Uh, we want to work with the local authorities and do what they say we need to do. But we still feel we need our contact with our clientele. So Zach is going to be kind of handling that. Russ and Rick are going to be handling some of that also. Uh, what what they are asking me, Russ and Rick, is to put together um, a, a publication that uh, is good for potential customers and for our existing customers. Uh, we had a gentleman that rep for us for many years by the name of Ed Bolsher. And uh, this is something that Ed had talked about quite often uh, when we would travel, uh, when Ed moved to Florida, we traveled to Florida by pickup and we discussed this quite in detail for many years. And I told Ed, I just, I don't have the time for it. If I'm traveling with you guys, I just don't have the time to write. So uh, this year, Rick has made up his mind that, uh, that, that we're gonna accomplish that. And we have accomplished an initiate uh, part of that project. Uh, the way we're envisioning it is as a series of publications that discusses the, the grower's philosophy. And what we started out with was just the grower's program, trying to explain, you know, our side of the story, why we think it works the way it is uh, or the way it does. Uh, we take quite offense to the snake oil thing that is hung on us by the establishment um, or the co-ops and we think we've got fundamental research that backs us up and that is part of this publication and we've made it in such a way that uh, it can be utilized in different versions in other words we talk about the product we talk about calcium uh, we talk about photosynthetic activity and whatever your basic interest is you can focus on that part of the publication. <clears throat> and that publication will be released uh, for the annual meeting. Uh, it it uh, was put together 
uh, in uh, kind of a more crude form, and then it was taken and, uh, you know, what I call decorated, put in a form that hopefully will make it more acceptable, more readable. Uh, I, I discussed this with David Armstrong, and David says, man, if you read any service manual on these, these combines or tractors, he said, I don't know who writes those things, Jim, but they certainly don't know how to, how to get the message across. So hopefully – uh, we've done that a little bit better. Uh, like Dave said, he just keeps looking until he gets the the page with the picture that he that he knows has got the part he's looking for. And so we've kind of done it that type of way. So hopefully it's something that, that everybody will find quite usable, whether they're a potential customer. Those of you that have been with us for 60 years, hopefully you'll find it interesting and helpful and Help help your operation. That's the legacy of Victor Tegens is to uh, be helpful, uh, make your operation better. Yeah, we want to do business, but by the same token, we want to contribute to your success. Uh, we always felt the more successful you were, the the easier it was for us to do business with you. So that's really uh, um, what we're trying to do with this particular publication is to. Um, give you something that will help your operation and uh, give you some insight into what we're trying to do uh, at Growers. So I think uh, with that, I'll look at my cheat sheets here. Oh, okay, there's two other things I need to discuss uh, quickly here. Uh, when the uh, next sales letter comes out, <clears throat> there's going to be a couple articles in there for guys to look at. Um, about two weeks ago, maybe three now, Syngenta came out with a, um, a big announcement that they had purchased a very large biological company. And uh, the, uh, the CEOs were making statements of why this happened. Uh, the biological company talked about the different things that they do. And this article pretty well substantiates what we think uh, is going on in agriculture now. Uh, when these big chemical companies and Pioneer or Corteva or whatever you want to call them, they've already made large investments like that. They've actually got products that are coming out, biological products that they've been promoting for several years now. And see, a lot of this is related to uh, human medicine as we see uh, the movement towards the use of immunology with certain types of syndromes, cancer, heart disease, diabetes. Uh, it, it's immune system related. And see, this is something we've tried to discuss with uh, customers, potential customers for years, is this biological idea in the soil and how it works and how that is how we're trying to promote your production because again, that's the way the system is designed. And see, that's discussed in detail in the publication <clears throat> is how this photosynthetic factory of the plant is working in unison, you know, with the biological and the soil to feed them. And see, the farmer is just interrupting that cycle, you know, to try to produce yield. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that, um, is something that's really gaining momentum in agriculture. And as you read this particular article, it's kind of interesting that the CEO from the biological company is saying it's pretty well known that half of all applied fertilizer is being lost. And see, if you go back to the establishment of US EPA in 1972 by Richard Nixon, uh, the first uh, publications that came out uh, like the Journal of Environmental Quality by the American Society of Agronomy, they said in there that uh, there was always at least 50% loss of applied nitrogen. This was pretty well uh, accepted within the, within the establishment. And see, we feel this is a continual problem that's building. And so we try to talk about that. The other article that'll be in there will discuss how the state of Minnesota is now putting a lid 
on the amount of fall applied nitrogen. See, when you get in the upper Midwest, anhydrous is pretty well the name of the game, quiet in the fall so that you can go faster in the spring. And see, right now, the state of Minnesota has certain areas where they're not going to allow that. And see, a lot of farmers feel that this infringement on their fertil fertilization rights <clears throat> is pretty well, you know, um, makes them immune to any kind of regulation. And I think farmers need to take a very close look at dicamba and what's happening there. As we've had the movement uh, from the executive branch, which is US EPA, and the use of dicamba was pretty well stopped um, by the judicial branch, the Ninth Circuit in California uh, last summer when they stopped the application for beans in June and cotton in July, now the executive branch has come back right now and has said that's that's not going to stay. That they're going to give them a new five-year uh, uh, grant on this to go ahead and use it. Well, you know that there is going to be another lawsuit that goes to the Ninth Circuit, and see if the Ninth Circuit overrules them, uh, we're going to see that uh, dicamba is going to be put on the back burner, and see. I, I say that this is going to come for fertilizer eventually. And see, farmers think that uh, that's probably not going to happen. Well, uh, I don't think a year ago farmers would have said they could have stopped dicamba. And we see it in our neighborhood, guys that have raised seed, uh, dicamba-tolerant seed uh, that have stopped producing it. Uh, actually, they had it planted, never put it in the bin, all there to market to go for feed. But again, this is uh, a total change of what's happening, you know, out in uh, out in the field. So again, we think uh, we can help farmers with the uh, environmental aspects of fertilizer application, and that's something that uh, we will continue to talk about. We think the biological aspect in the soil is really the big key there. Okay, at that point, excuse me, I think um, I've got everything covered. Um, Ian Archibald, are, are you out there, Ian? If you are, yes, you can I am. Me. I don't know how to. How do I get on here, Mars? You're um, you're on, partner. You're on, partner. We can hear you very good. Okay. Yeah, um, this is this is Ian Archibald, folks. Uh, Ian uh, <clears throat> is a district manager, uh, farmer up in Canada. And if you look at the uh, the 2019 calendar, the uh, November picture is actually Ian's uh, uh, market at his farm. And so we wanted to get Ian to discuss a little bit about some of the things he's done. He's been with us a long time. He's got a nice clientele that he works with up there. and. Uh, We'd certainly like to give him a, a little bit of a pat on the back and uh, let him uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what was going on up there this year. And uh, uh, you can chat a little bit about your market, too, Ian. You can you can run with the ball any direction you want to run in. Okay, this is a, a market of one of my clients. And uh, he's, uh, it's called Tin Cap Berry Farm. He's uh, down in eastern Ontario. His main thing is, uh, believe it or not, is berries. But his wife loves flowers. And so she decorates this up. And they've uh, relegated a whole building to, um, to produce. They produce... Um, like like everything, like we would produce, just not sweet corn, but they have a lot of sweet corn. But they mainly, they they look at uh, berries, bl uh, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, and uh, and folks come from miles to uh, to participate in this. These guys, uh, I've got them putting some lime on, and, and now they're. Spraying regularly with uh, growers, 
they um, they're finding their shelf life is a lot better. Um, people are just just loving every minute of it. It's uh, tremendous quality, and as you see in this picture here, it's <laughs> it's pretty well decorated, pretty well done in November. That this is the November picture. It's just a she she's an artist, <laughs> and it's just beautiful the way she's. Uh, set things up and people are just drawn into here because of the quality and they know it's good stuff. What was their hey Ian, what was their year like this year up there? Were they wet, dry or what what's that situation? Um well they did have a dry spell but this year was phenomenal for them. They just um yeah, it was it was a banner year for them. What's uh, how would you how would you talk a little bit about you know exactly where you're at and then what kind of weather you did have this year and what kind of problems you might have dealt with? Well, this this summer we we had a it was a, a, a wet spring, but everything got in okay. But then there was a about a five week dry snap, just dry like like I mean dry, nothing, um, and it just tended to hasten um, maturity. It tended to, uh, well, it cut back yield, but generally speaking, um, folks that had lime and uh, and they had a good root structure, um, they were just tickled pink, and some of them had banner yields. Just even, even though there was that big, big dry spell in the middle. What about the uh, livestock guys? I mean, as far as forage was concerned, uh, was that uh, was the dry spell enough to give them problems too? Um, not too bad. Um, like all my guys, I I get them to. We spray growers on stuff. Like we take the first cut off, let it green up, and spray again. And um, when we had that dry spell, it just seemed to motor right through that. And um, and and I know I have uh, a couple of guys with that I spray all their hay, and uh, they 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 had the best yield they've ever had. And even though we had that dry spell. Those guys were just tickled pink, and uh, and yeah, it just really worked well for them. Do you do you find that that people get a little scared when it turns dry like that to keep foliar feeding uh, until they actually see it happen? You know, they're a little reluctant to to put some money into the crop because they think they're you know they're really struggling, but that's really when that's- they can help themselves the best, right? That, that's exactly right, Jim, and it's an awful hard sell. It's like pushing a chain uphill. <laughs> These guys, uh, yeah. no, I'm serious. These guys, oh, yeah. I'm not going to put money into that crop. It's going to die. Well, I said, well, it's not going to die. Let's let's try and feed it while, it, while we can, and, and it'll just enhance some root structure here, and, and I say this this will pull right through, but no, no. But when they see, like, I, I go ahead and spray, but when they see uh, the results of a neighbor, then they, they think twice. But, but it's awful yeah. hard to convince anybody to begin with. Right, right. It's just like throwing good money after bad, you know. So. Oh, again, yeah, I yeah. And that, it's a tough Yeah, no sell, sweet no way doubt. I'm going to do that. Well, here, let's, let's just try 10 acres. Just try it. And see if you notice a difference. And wow, you know. Yeah. See the thing I love is that, that wow. Yeah, yeah. I think guys got to realize that when you got the sunlight like that, if you can keep the plant growing, I mean, your harvest of sugar continues, and uh, that as you store more sugar, even though the volume is not as high, the concentration of sugar is higher. Your feed value is just going to skyrocket. So. Yeah, yeah, and and then come harvest time, they forgot all about the dry spell. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
That's right. Oh. Okay. Hey, very good, Ian. I, I got to get the cutterback boys on here. So I really hey, well, appreciate you getting on and giving us a little yeah. highlight up there. Uh, glad to help you, Jim. Hey, you take care of yourself, man. Steven, you and Jason, are you ready? We are. Oh, I knew you boys were born ready. So this is uh, this is out of the air. Stephen, Stephen Jake Cutterback, uh, they're from Kenny Atlas, New York. I'll let them talk a little bit about exactly. It's in the Finger Lakes area, and uh, these guys um, uh, they they've got a real interesting story. They they were at our annual meeting uh, last year or the year before, and uh, it was. Uh, Got pretty interesting on some of the things that they were talking about, and our guys uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. So uh, they're they're the October picture. Uh, that's uh, their lineage there <clears throat> with the eggplant, and actually they're they're going to be in the uh, twenty uh, twenty one calendar also. So uh, they they loaded up. The, they've just overlined this garden. And it's just uh, these plants are just struggling tremendously. So I'll let you guys run to whatever degree and wherever you want to run. Well, sounds good, Jim. Thanks for having us on, it's Jason. But um, yeah, as you can see, I don't know how many photos I've sent you over the spring and summer months of of the garden, but you can see how many times I've I really screwed up the ground and ruined my garden and everything else in between but i think on that piece of ground that we have there it's kind of a weird uh, an odd shaped piece of ground it's it's too small to get anything really big on um, that we currently have so we just kind of use it as a garden plot really probably over the last oh i don't know 40 50 years it's probably gotten close to anywhere from 70 to 70 to 80 tons worth of lime um and at any given point so obviously i screwed it up right from the get-go there and uh but yeah i i, I tend to have a lot of stuff in the garden that um i use for our family and my grandparents and take it to work and but as you can see in that october photo that's my oldest son cole he's a pretty big component of uh, the farm now and he helps out a lot in the garden but uh, as you can see, that, that was off of one plant. Um, by the time I get done feeding my most of my uh, plants with growers, um, I'm up to about two cups of, of fertilizer per gallon. I start out pretty slow, at maybe about a, a tablespoon or two tablespoons per gallon, and I fertilize once a week or as, as many times as I feel like it. But usually by the time I'm done, I'm up to about two cups of three growers per, per gallon of water. And I, I feed every third day um, in the garden. And I really I really dose them pretty well. I mean, I, I'll use up that whole one gallon worth of growers there in one shot in the garden and have to remix. But, yeah, the, the ground really produces for us here in this area. We like the – we definitely like the growers. Um, think off of probably what I had just in that zucchini picture, um, I think we weighed out five or six hundred pounds worth of zucchini just off of six plants. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and when my, my peppers came on, I was picking uh, 10 to 15 pounds per plant um, every week on, on six plants. <laughs> And when I came time to get tomatoes, I like to do a lot of tomatoes, mostly Romas, because of um, sauce. I, we make our own sauce here that I use for the winter months, so I don't have to buy any of it. And uh, I was over a thousand pounds and just tomatoes on on 30 plants that oh. I figured. So I must have done something wrong. Still trying to figure that out. But what uh, the well, hate that's hate that's Hey, Jason, there's one question I've got. Now, <clears throat> I know, uh, you know, your dad and your granddad, you know, got started on this 
you know, you you didn't put all 70 ton on in one year. What do you, what's your protocol for applying lime to the garden? How do you, is there anything you follow or just when you go by, when you're liming, you'll throw some on? What What's your protocol on that? Yeah, the, the protocol is pretty much the cleanup. So if he's only got a load or two left that's sitting there that he can't put anywhere else, it, it always goes to the garden. And it, it's probably <laughs> four to eight ton almost every other year, if not every year, just because it's mm-hmm. there. It's on the way to another field. And it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon or 6, and I don't want to go way up back <laughs> and spread that load so the garden gets it. Gotcha. Continuing research on ruination of the soil with high amounts of calcium wine. <laughs> that, so far, the research has been, uh, for us, a success for, for the establishment of failure. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But the reason, one of the reasons why we chose this garden, and there's a lot of growers, customers in this country and Canada that are gardeners or, or vegetable crop guys. And we try to plant a little bit of everything all over the place and, and put the research out for you guys to put in the newsletters and stuff so that they can uh, read, read up on, you know, if they have nervous about sweet corn, if they're nervous about potatoes, zucchini, uh, parsnips, any of the things that we've done a little experimentation with, they can call us or read our articles or whatever and get some idea on the growers program and their specific needs for their vegetables. Um, you know, we, we've we used it all over the place. Uh, growers, uh, growers is the only fertilizer and it's the only one that we've bought for years and years and years. And of course your high calcium lime is the piles are everywhere. This, I, I had a bunch of trucks in this summer and the stuff is everywhere. And uh, but it works wonderfully with everything, and uh, Jason does a good job there with that garden plot. And uh, another thing, I, as long as people are listening and stuff, if you wanted to call and ask questions, uh, my phone number is 315-246-8531, and that's uh, my personal cell, and I will give that number out again later on for people that didn't have something right with it, they wanted to call and ask questions. I'm a salesman myself and put on meetings and stuff here. But, uh, you know, if anybody, customer or sales people, whatever, have any questions, there's probably not much of anything we haven't done. And when people ask us questions about calcium usage and growers on this and that, we'll We'll, we'll bring it out of recall and, uh, you know, may not have it written down now or, or you know, or having a newsletter type of format. We'll see all about it when you call us. Hey, Steve, yeah. one yeah. one thing I'd like you to comment on a little bit is the, the lime that you're using, uh, where it comes from, uh, you know, and and what what kind of form is it? Is it? relatively dry is it wet do you need to let it dry uh what sure. kind of spreader do you have uh kind of go through that for guys okay what i uh what i get is the uh stuff that's thrown away at the places the quarries that uh, make black top um in new york state and probably everywhere else they have to filter the air at the black top plant to get all the calcium stone dust out of them, you know, keep it from drifting over on the beautiful communities that surround these quarries. So <laughs> with EPA regulations, you have to do that. Well, this stuff is airborne, so obviously it's fine. And the filters drop it into a, a bin, and that product is called bag house dust. Or, uh, you know, who knows what other companies have fancy names for this product. And then they haul it out back and dump it. There's hundreds of thousands of tons in my quarry locally. And uh, um, 
I buy that. Now it comes out of that bin dry as can be, and it flows like water. So if, there's, if they're hauling it with a 10-wheeler and they've got a pin hole in the box, it's squirting out about four feet before it hits the ground. <laughs> and it's, it's absolutely the finest product you could ever cook. Originally, before they collected it, it was airborne. And so it immediately goes to work. It's very, very good stuff, and it's a waste product. So we get it here, and uh, it, it sits outside. Um, it gets water. You know, it rains on it, obviously. It gets wet, and that's the best stuff you can get because it handles nicely. It sits in a pile. You put it in your spreader on Chandler, 10-ton Chandler, tandem axle spreader. 34-inch chain and very steep sides, and uh, um, it'll put out whatever rate you want, and um, based on speed and, and adjustability, uh, I usually try and put out four tons the acre. Um, I, I can tell you that one of the phenomena that we have uh, run into this year, again, is the where I spread this product in 2010, on some ground way away from my house, I put in the corn this year because it's been so repeated soybeans for a long time. And back in 2010, when I put eight, this product on per acre, the corn yield went from probably 100 bushels to the acre historically to 250. In that season, I applied the line. And um, not to be outdone, the 24-acre field next door went to, well, yielded 170 in 2010. So I've had beans out over there for the last nine years, and this year I put out a 91-day DeKalb hybrid um, June 1st, last corn I planted. And uh, lo and behold, the 24-acre field that I hadn't put any lime on in 10 years, yielded 175 bushel the acre, 20 percent job. At that, at that, but the, the uh, readout on my 2020 monitor is dry shell corn. So that's 175 bushel dry shell corn. It picked up five bushels from 2010 and yield, and without any lime added since. Not to be out the 3.6 acre field right next door. And yielded another 250 bushels to the acre again. So my research indicates that this calcium stays put somehow. And if you're not mining, sending it downstream or doing something chemically, now this is growers program soil uh, since I took it over in 05. And uh, so obviously the program is sound. And you don't need to add the lime every couple of years or whatever. But I, uh, in, in lieu of soil sampling, I look out the windshield of the combine. <laughs> this, year, this year I have discovered that where I stopped really laying the lime on, for some reason I probably ran out and didn't go back, or it was over, you could see a distinct line in the field and the weed uh, pressure was a little higher where I hadn't put as much lime on as I should have and the yield on my monitor showed about a 50 bushel difference. So that's Steve, I want you to, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your thought process. I know you're strip killing. Uh, yep. If guys are going to start out with applying lime, I mean, what what's your what's the best advice you think you can give them as far as tillage is concerned? What would you like to see them do to to make sure and see the, the how how do you feel about depth of getting calcium down? Is that a key factor also? Well, it yes and no. There's several things that I like to do that are at odds with even my son, Jason. He likes to see things done a little differently. Where, but what one, there's several items that I'm after with the application of high calcium lime and 
my tillage methods with the zone builder. Mm -hmm. I go deep. And I go deep so that I rip up any compaction that was done previous by somebody else or by myself mm -hmm. by mistake on a wet season. And I also put the, when I'm doing corn ground, I go deep and I put nitrogen in the bottom of the hole. Now, deep, I'm telling you, 11, 12 inches. And mm -hmm. uh, if, if you've got some seriously questionable soil, put the calcium on. Don't 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 go by anybody's recommendations, but um, your own um, knowledge of, of what happens if you apply. My my point is, you got to get enough lime on to break through that buffer or whatever they're going to call it. You want to call that? There's a, there's truly a wall uh, in the soil. And when you saturate the calcium in that soil up beyond that uh, buffer zone, that wall or whatever, everything opens up. Um, and by that I mean the soil opens up and the water goes in. We got uh, two inches of rain the other day, and I'm combining today. Now, the other day being Wednesday, right, Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday mm -hmm. we got these rain, and I'm out with a combine today, and I don't even have mud on the tire. <laughs> and, uh, well, and, and there's been a dry summer here, so there's plenty sure. of holding capacity. But on my property, the water goes down. And and uh, because of the lime. It's all because of the lime and, and the, the program and uh, – that we've used with the growers and we only put on enough nitrogen um, to what we feel is appropriate for a crop of corn, about half what they they recommend us to do. If I lived in Iowa, they would recommend a lot more for, uh, nitrogen, and I'm, I'm getting the same yields as my family is out in Iowa, in New York State. And uh, Now, would you, would you then, if a guy's going to, put calcium on the first time, you would definitely want him to work it in some way or to till it. Yeah. Yes. Don't plow it. I think every farmer should own a plow, but I really don't care if you know where it is at any given time of the season. It's nice to have a plow. You can show it to people, but just don't use it. If you want to do tillage, you get a chisel plow, a deep ripper, uh, something, something to that effect. It doesn't have to be the fancy stuff that they're selling today, the Dominators and the, all these other cool names for uh, ripper, disc rippers and stuff. Um, I, I just use a zone builder to break through compaction and make a nice area for the corn root to go straight down as fast as it can go, and the water goes in there too. But, that, yes, I think the calcium, it, it, you're going to get the most dollar for your line payments if you uh, put it in with a chisel or mix it, mix it in the profile, the profile being however deep you want your root to go. And if you have to do it twice, uh, I'd say put on five ton, chisel it in, put on another five ton. Wilbur Franklin told me at a meeting one time in the 70s, 60s, no, 80s, that um, if I got only enough budget for 100 tons of lime, he'd rather have me put it on 10 acres of land all at once than to spread it out over 50 acres at two tons of acre. He said because it will be a lime uh, buy and fool the following season. <laughs> and he was right. So I think what really helps us out in this area as well is that we, we really promote, uh, other than just the high calcium line, but the less tillage is more, um, you know, because you're not turning that ground over, you're not drying the ground out, you're not losing moisture, you're not, 
you're not losing your your biological profile. You're keeping your organic matter high. You still get residue. Um, in, encompassed with the high calcium lime, I think that's what's really um, what's really helping us at this point in at the stage in the game. Uh, we've been farting around with some some newer, not really newer tech, but some newer ideas on. Uh, we tried out a couple acres with zone building. I had my my son pack the ground and then. Dad went right behind and planted all in the same um, without a village. Um, the only village we had was his own builder. Um, and surprisingly, he saved a little bit of money that per acre base because he didn't have to hit it at the time with a disc. Um, so he had a little bit of money in his pocket. So, But at least in this area, I'm, you know, the village is, is, is pretty key. Um, you know, the more times you run over the ground, the more times you beat it up, the more stuff you're going to lose. Either it's nutrients or sediments to the water erosion. It ends up in the lakes and streams, which obviously isn't a great spot for it. But, uh, you know, you lose your organic matter. So, yeah, tillage really is is the key along with, um, like Dad was saying, the high calcium line for sure. Now, uh, thing. One, one, one thing I would like you guys to comment on is this root penetration. You know, Ian made the statement there previously that, you know, when it got dry, he said, you know, his guys just, they kind of ran right through it with no problem. Um, this, this, you know, when you get 70 ton, you know, on that garden, I mean, your root penetration has got to be fantastic. What What's your guys' comment on that? Well, it's unrestricted, basically. I mean, the, the we we had parsnips we dug with a backhoe. They were my my dad was standing down in the ditch of this in 2000. We got pictures of that. We sent to you, and yeah. there were three long. Oh, they were they were so deep. He kept breaking them off, and he was getting perplexed. And I said, "Well, here's the backhoe. Let's take them with that." And he could not believe they were three foot deep. It's, right. Yeah, it's really right. it's a combination of items, Jim. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm pretty good big proponent on like I said tillage, and then also cover crops is another big item, hot ticket mm -hmm. item I like to put with some of my producers here in the county. But you know, using that zone builder, I mean, you, you drop that thing 14 inches in the ground and break up that restriction zone that you've had for probably a hundred years since it was plowed last. Right. As soon as you break that profile, the, you know, it's a whole other game. You know, the water goes mm -hmm. in, it doesn't pond on top, it doesn't run off. You know, this is the, probably right. the second year in the in the 15 years I've lived in my house down the road. This is the second summer I've run out of water um, from being dry. And with mm -hmm. the, the rain I've been getting, especially the last five years where uh, the the village down the road from here, they received 30 inches in July of 17, which blew out the whole Whoop. village. But we didn't Whoop. have any standing water. You know, it, it stood for five five to ten hours and then was gone. It seeped down right. into the profile because we didn't have any restriction zone anymore. So we've sure. smashed our restriction zone, you know, causing that root profile to go deeper and deeper and find its own water and food. Mm -hmm. And if, like you would tell at your meetings, of uh, the 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 plant foods there, we're just right. making it available. That's right. And See, and that micro that, micro that, free will that's right. on everything. Yep. Seeing that the air is critical, guys. That's the deal. You get that oxygen deep so that that biological functions. That's a key item. And see, if you got it ponded full of water, that ain't going to happen. If you can get that water out of there, man, that air comes back, you'll keep that population at its maximum. Right. Well, it's the old story, you know. How long can you go without food? How long can you <laughs> go without food? How long can you hold your breath? That's right. Exactly. You got dead exactly. on, Steve. Yeah, that's exactly what the plant goes through. And uh, I got a, another. I've got a high calcium ground that has been um, uh, taken care of quite nicely, and it's really responding good. And I put out a 
my first corn I put out with a hybrid that was 104 day, brand new company, and uh, didn't look quite right when it emerged. And so the territory manager come out, looked at it, says, man, this looks like 50% loss to me. And I said, okay, well, we'll see. Uh, you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm going <laughs> to let it I'm going to see what we get because I, I'm going to give it some fertilizer and polar feed it and uh, nitrogen side dress and whatever. He gave me uh, my seed, my half my seed corn money back immediately, and that uh, ended up yielding 180 bushel. Woo! Wow! And you know, this is 138 bushel county here. Wow! So no, it, it, you know, it, it was a sand it come, problem, Steve, or just the way the corn looked. Yeah. No, it's merged uh, seed rotted. I For some see. reason, okay. poor emergence. And, uh, uh, and, of course, you know, after 48 hours, that next one out to weed. Yep, and, uh, yep. And so, you know, it, it, it was truly a, an issue. And, it, you know, I think the healthy soil and our, our growers program snapped it yep. out of it. And it, it flexed and it did good. Yep. It's like, crop insurance. it's like crop insurance, this lime is. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know? If you've got a potash budget, right now we haven't spread potash in, in 20 years or, or more, other than just some research here, research there, and never got my money back when I did. I went out with the program. Uh, but we uh, take your potash budget by lime. Mm-hmm. And uh, it doesn't have to be the lime that they say. You go and find your good source of calcium lime. If you've got calcareous stone quarries around like we have, it's there. Right. And they're taking that same stuff, the experts are, and uh, storing it indoors and getting $40 a ton for it. <laughs> I'm, I'm buying 650 Mm-hmm. It's, okay, uh, gentlemen. I think I gotta I gotta shut you off at this point. We we've kind of run over the limit here, but I I, I really appreciate it. And uh, anybody that's listening uh, next year at this time, these boys will be back because they've got pepper pricker going into 2021. So uh, the garden is still doing the thing, even though it's consistently highly overlined. So. I appreciate it, guys. Yep, and you can post my number. At, you know, somebody calls in and wants it, give them my cell phone. I will do that. I appreciate Thank that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, gentlemen, uh, like I said, in December, uh, this this number isn't going to work for you. So if, if you're very interested in the uh, presentation in December, uh, talk with your sales rep or call Mylan and uh, we'll get you the the numbers you need or uh, if you're going to try to get on it vir- virtually uh, we'll give you the uh, the websites that you need and hopefully uh, we can get guys that will be very interested in that so thanks for everybody listening in I appreciate it very much take care